Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to uh, jump into a discussion that I hope won't be too long. Um, I don't want to stand between you and the Oculus, but uh, uh, where we talk about some considerations for applying the CCM algorithm that we've been talking about. For comments earlier, I will try to pull together some uh, some example uh, output uh, from it uh, for tomorrow. Um, uh, and uh, I'll try to feature that uh, during the grab bag of topics that we're going to be covering tomorrow, which uh, includes some very important discussions. But I, while, whilst it's fresh in our mind and while you're prior to glimpsing reconstructed state spaces, shadow manifolds within the, uh, the Oculus, um, I thought I'd, I'd, I'd talk some about CCM uh, further. So I want to remind us that what CCM gives us. CCM builds on the theory of state space embedding. What you will see in the Oculus context is reconstructed state spaces, cases where we've taken time series. And by applying this lens of delay embedding, we see the underlying state space that gave rise to that, to that um, time series. And that state space, by definition, includes a representation of the various factors that are causally driving that, that observed variable. And CCM takes advantage of this. CCM seeks to assess the causal influence of, of variable Y on variable X uh, by performing X cross map Y. Um, oh, thanks, Lujay. Uh, I could survive without it for a while. Um, so here we are estimating y using the shadow manifold x for different library sizes, different subsets of the x time series that are considered. And then we assess basically how does rho change as l rises. In the absence of noise, um, a causal connection from y to x means the coefficient rho will rise to 1. Um, with enough data points. And the stronger the causal connection, the faster the convergence, okay? The more noise, or if we're embedding in a poor choice of E, the slower the, the convergence. Actually, particularly with the, uh, with the uh, specifically the, uh, the choice of E. So a key factor to look for here is convergence as L rises. It's not enough to look for one library size and say, is it, convergent or not, you have to look for a variety of different L and, and view the different values of rho. Wow, this is great. Okay, so a couple key points I want to communicate about this. It's absolutely essential that you use multiple realizations. The code in R, which we're providing for you, will specify something like a thousand realizations. I do not recommend running fewer than 250 for serious analysis, even for very exploratory stuff, doing less than 100 is very dangerous. So you're, you're gonna run, wanna run many realizations. I don't, for, for sort of serious results, I don't trust something less than 1,000. Secondly, the choice of tau can have a sizable impact on results, and, and tau equals one is not always the best choice. This gets into this issue of how frequently things are sampled. I showed earlier how if things are sampled frequently, if you have a tau as one, basically you're gonna have, the things are gonna line up in the diagonal of the state space. It's not gonna be that, that helpful, certainly for visualization. Data conditioning can make a huge difference in determining perception of convergence. So Young Chen referred to this for her HMM. She actually took the data that she was originally provided and she transformed it. And generally you want to do this for CCM. So you may want to provide what's called first order differencing, which is basically taking not the original data, but 
differences in the data between each successive value of it. And you may want to standardize it, statistically standardize it, to center it on a zero mean, zero, and a one standard deviation. Um, that can be useful. And finally, you want to you want to explore different values of e, the embedding dimension. How what's the size of the space? I depicted, for convenience, I depicted things in three dimensional space. Um, but uh, you may wish to. Uh, you, in general, you want to examine um, uh, different uh, size dimensions besides besides three. Okay, so. Um, just be aware that E does matter, and you won't always want to assume one E. You want to try for a couple uh, different varieties of E. These are E of three. These are E of two here, um, uh, or this is E of two. It's two-dimensional. It's flat like a paper. This is three-dimensional. What you'll see in the Oculus is three-dimensional. In general, for E, um, we might want to see uh, a larger number of dimensions, and generally it's good to do that. I would suggest doing things for different E um, and, uh, and exploring. I used to do a lot of mean plots for different E and only then do realization density plots of the sort that I showed you, um, those sort of uh, very colorful uh, uh, shots showing uh, convergence, statistical, or or in terms of CCM, these ones. Um, I, I, I significantly prefer these these days, but I might sometimes do a plot of a mean. Uh, CCM is, is really best suited for assessing causality between variables that, that evolve over time in a fairly autonomous way, meaning they're not just functions of some other variable. They're they're based, for example, on an underlying dynamic system which evolves, say, by differential equations uh, or, or some other f factors. And, and um, it's, it's not a good approach to apply a, as a test when you just have you know, a variable that's generated randomly and another variable that's a function of it. Um, so I noted earlier in a better graph than this, the presence of outliers. Outliers um, will happen if you run too many, um, uh, too few realizations, you're gonna potentially um, get confused uh, because you'll, you'll only be considered anomalous, anomalous uh, outliers. Okay, so let's talk about the effect of E. E actually, this, this is showing mean plots. E can change the mean. E can lead to changed results. Um, uh, results in terms of the, the value of, of rho found, okay? Um, so this is sort of an appropriate E, and you can see if you have an E that's much larger. This is the correct E of four, this is an E of 32. It converges, it just converges more slowly. I have, I have much better graphs from this than I'll need to put into the, to the presentation uh, for experiments that I've done. But fundamentally, having an E that's way off is not fatal. It just often leads to, to sort of slower convergence, for example. Um, and similarly, sometimes you can have non-causal connections that, that actually do look causal for an E that's quite far off. And you do have to watch out for that. So this is a non-causal connection, and as you ramp E up to something really, really high, like 32, it could start to look causal. This is dangerous. I don't go generally above E equal about 10. I rarely find it needed at all. So and when you start getting to extreme values of E, like 32, I, I think generally you've gone too far, okay? Um, and, uh, and you just have to look out for those uh, extreme values of, of, of E. So I mentioned first order differencing. The idea behind first order differencing is you take the original data set and you create a new data set whose values are just the differences of successive values in the original data set. So if you had an original data set which had you know, x of 0, x of 1, x of 2, x of 3, x of 4, where 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 different times, 
the new data set will be x of 1 minus x of 0, and then x of 2 minus x of 1, and then x of 3 minus x of 2. It would just be the difference. And this type of um, analysis is used by Sugihara a lot. Um, I find it quite helpful. Uh, you'll notice that um, without it, sometimes you can have this is, this is for some data we got from Andrew, four-year unemployment and monthly crude suicide rate. This is for different values of tau and without first differencing, and this is with first differencing, um, where it can really just make it much, uh, much less sensitive to, to tau. It can help it be less sensitive to the absolute values of things in ways that are helpful. This is without differencing, and this is with differencing. Less of a big value, big difference here. It changes a little bit uh, some of the differences. Um, so I suggest performing first differencing when you cross map from a state variable that are accumulations, um, uh, but not from variables that are not state variables. So if you do x, x map, cross map, y, you're trying to see if y influences x. I do first differencing if x is a, is a stock, but not if it's a flow variable. And I don't have fully time to explain it, but basically if it's an accumulation, I do first differencing. If it's just a, a rate, for example, an incidence rate, I'm not going to do first differencing because there's no inertia with it. There's no sort of, um, um, it, it doesn't just vary from its previous value. It, each, each month it's, um, it's uh, being computed sort of from scratch. And so I use first differencing when we're dealing with stocks, when we're dealing with things that are part of the state of the system. So maybe it will be the number of kids uh, in protection, or maybe it would be um, uh, a person's blood pressure, or maybe it would be a, um, uh, a, a number of, of individuals who are unemployed um, that would be a, a state variable, whereas the number of attempts at suicide would be a, um, it's, it's not a state of the system, it's something that, that uh, is a rate that, that applies and, and has different numbers every month. So Dorian, is that looking encouraging? Okay, okay. Um, Dorian's working with the Oculus, okay. Um, so undifferenced uh, stock variables, I've done a lot of experiments with this and will be glad to show them. In fact, I think I will post them. Um, but um, when you have undifferenced variables versus differenced, um, uh, it, can, it can make at least small differences. I haven't found it to make an absolute night and day difference, but it can make some small difference. Um, you could see between this and this, for example, which is quite distinctive um, in terms of, of how it, uh, how it, um, how it is depicts. Okay, now this is one of the most key and practical issues. How does noise affect things? Well, um, the basic deal with noise is that when you, when you have a system which has a lot of things going on which you treat as stochastics, Essentially, it can, it can have very high dimension. And ideal noise is arbitrarily high, high dimension. Okay. In, the, in the presence of noise, um, uh, an asymptotic, uh, in, uh, sorry, um, right. Um, so in the presence of noise, the asymptotic value of rho, as rho rises with L size, will typically go to a value less than one. It won't rise all the way to one. As one adds noise, um, some non-causal connections can sometimes, uh, uh, th their, their value can, uh, can rise uh, in terms of the apparent correlation. Um, and the effects of noise can be amplified or reduced by uh, changes in, in E. So here's a causal link. Here's no noise at all. You can see it's, it's very tight. It converges. Apologies for the crudeness of this. Again, I, I need to update it. Um, here's with moderate noise, uh, with an asymptote of 0.65, uh, and you'll notice here with high noise. 
and the asymptote is 0.17. So it's brought this down successively from 1 to 0.65 to 0.17, adding a large amount of noise. Adding in noise successively brings down what the value this eventually goes to. It still looks causal, plausibly, but it's been brought down a lot in terms of its, of its ultimate, uh, ultimate value. Okay, um, so, um, you know, in terms of distinguishing true cross-mapping from statistical convergence, uh, I commented on this previously, I won't comment on it again, it's much better to deal with the sort of density plots that I showed uh, previously, these sort of density plots um, as compared to plots like this. Um, this is an indication of no causality. You can again see it because of the, the fringe here. Okay. Um, right. Um, so the length of the time series being analyzed can have a huge impact. Um, so as I had mentioned earlier, I don't like to perform CCM with with, that, with lengths of time series less than one, something less than 200 or 250, I, I feel somewhat uncomfortable. Um, it's great if you can get thousands. Um, and uh, you do, you do want to have longer because it'll allow you to see if rho is going up as you increase L. Um, and you want to go beyond the time where the sort of size of L where there's a lot of just stochastics in the convergence of rho. Um, uh, and uh, you want to have a long enough time series to sample from a variety of characteristics. Okay, um, so, so for example here we have a, um, we have a short 400 uh, time series. Identical system, identical system with 2,000 length and you can see uh, a night and day difference. Here, the causal connection, uh, X5 to X, to y, sorry, Y5 to Y3, it doesn't look that much more causal than the other connection. Once you get to a longer time series, it's like night and day. It's, it's just very clear. It's like having a large enough telescope to resolve some features on the moon. You're trying to do it with a fuzzy image, with a small telescope, with a large enough telescope, large enough length, it, it all turns out in terms of the resolution to resolve causality. Um, so, so using longer time series is desirable. Now, if we think about daily time series, you know, 2,000 uh, days um, means, you know, uh, not, certainly uh, well less than a decade, but, but quite a few years. If we're dealing with monthly time series, you know, we're dealing with a very long t a period of time. Shao Yen's data set had, you know, 400 uh, time series and it spanned many decades. So, so getting, getting larger time series does, um, uh, does you know, limit uh, the ability to, to apply it uh, as readily when it's, um, when you don't have uh, a lot of data. Now Sugihara, the creator of this method, shows application very successfully with time series of size less than 100. Um, uh, I, I don't rule that out. In certain systems it may work very well. Um, I just say it's less reliable for those cases. It may be less, it may be more subject to noise, for example, in those cases. Okay, with shorter time series, there often appear to be difficulties between distinguishing causal and non-causal connections, um, uh, and uh, and uh, there's um, yeah, I, I'll I, I won't uh, comment more on that. Um, okay, um, visualization interfaces such as Dorian is exercising; uh, he's just taken it off. But uh, it's very helpful for changing, figuring out the impact of changing tau for its differencing or standardization. What's the impact of it? Okay. Now we have a lot of code um, that uh, we will be sharing, and uh, you're welcome 
to use. We show some examples of how it's applied. Um, but uh, it's good when you apply this, if you're seeking to apply it, to talk with someone who's applied a lot. And I'd be glad to discuss it. It's a technique I'm very fond of and have invested heavily in. Bo is spending much of his, his uh, graduate thesis work uh, creating mechanisms to apply it very efficiently to go from an upper limit of realistically three to 5,000 data points to upper limits that are in the tens of thousands or even potentially hundreds of thousands. We are seeking to industrialize and scale up our ability to apply CCM at scale at a, at a, for a variety of types of data. One of the types of data I'm most interested in is elements of big data, whether from smartphones or, or from uh, time series of Google searches or from Twitter, uh, other social media. So Dor Dorian, how are we doing with that? Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> the Oculus awaits. <laughs> so if people would like to try this, we're gonna, I recognize this uh, requires a little bit of a, of a disruption, but hopefully after some heavy lectures filled with concepts, you'll find an experiential component of this of interest. Let me explain a little bit about what Dorian can show you, okay? Um, so I, I've given reference uh, to the Oculus. The Oculus is a virtual reality system. It's a very popular virtual reality system. Um, we have uh, been working for a couple of years, and Dorian's really been the key person who's made this possible, to use the Oculus as a tool for scientific visualization, okay? And uh, we've, we've been investing in two basic visualization systems, both of which Dorian has implemented, in fact, in the same basic framework, um, in a very clean, clean way compared to uh, how people would normally do it, clean in the sense of good, good software engineering practices. So this, uh, visualization tool will support visualization of time series data using embedding, using embedding into to state spaces of, of uh, three dimensions. Uh, that sort of embedding can take, you'll recall, a time series like this and put it into uh, the context of a um, trajectory in, in reconstructed state space and, and, and what's called the shadow manifold. That's one sort of, of use of this system. Um, a second use of this system is in taking data that's cross-sectional in nature and using the oculus to visualize it on three different variables at the same time. So you can kind of think of it as a scatter plot, not for, you know, if you're used to thinking of scatter plots, you have X versus Y, and you have dots, each of which has a particular X and a particular Y, and you can look at the, whether X and Y are correlated, uh, for example. Here you do it in three dimensions. You can look at uh, the three-dimensional um, relationship between three variables cross-section. For uh, both those are different modes, as I understand it, still in the Oculus system. Is that fair to say? Uh, yeah, they both run at the same time. They, they, they they can, switch between them. You can switch between them um, readily. The data sets we, we look at are typically different. Um, Dorian, uh, do, you, do you happen to have still some um, time series data sets like Saskatoon temperature, or that sort of thing? That, that one's uh, under, yeah. Okay. Um, and maybe measles or chicken pox or something like that. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we'll, we'll check with that. So um, with the time series data sets, you can put it into a mode where it will visualize, um, visualize these points uh, in a reconstructed state space. The, the three axes, as for these other shadow manifolds, are the successive points um, when lagged by tau. In other words, considered current time, tau ago, and two times tau ago, um, units ago. 
Uh, and uh, in the system, you can pick tau at the start, or yeah. Or yeah, you no. Know, um, when you're doing the shadow manifold, yeah. you can change tau and apply it as you go. Awesome. So awesome. A different okay. Um, by contrast, all of it is in E of three because it's all in three dimensions by by its nature. Yeah, uh, Andrew. Can I ask a question about the row? Sure. It's a good question. The the so so CCM uh, does provide a way of assessing the strength, the relative strength of connections. It does so in a way that is affected. It's it's not untouched. It's affected by by noise. So if you have if you have a lot of other confounders, a lot of other factors that are that are getting in the way, um, that can lessen the apparent strength, um, particularly with stochastics uh, taking place. And uh, that, that needs to be borne in, in mind. I mean, it's, it, it, you, you could say, and I think legitimately, um, that that's, that that's reflected the fact that the actual instrumental causal strength, the sort of operational strength of the connection is less. And I'd say yes, it's less of a, of a full determiner of it. You know, if Y is less of a full determiner of that. Now as far as like, uh, okay, X cross map Y and X cross map Z are both very high. Let's suppose X cross map, you know, uh, Y is 0.8 and X cross map Z is 0.9. Um, uh, is it possible that Z is working through Y for some of its influence and then directly via other? And the answer is yes. It is, it is possible. What you'd want to look at there is, of course, Y cross map Z to see if Z is, is driving Y. And if so, there might be a, 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 a pathway there that's notable that you really want to take into account. And, and that's, this is one of CCM's more interesting applications is reconstructing causal pathways in my view. Um, not, not just dealing pairwise with variables, but actually trying to figure out what are the generative pathways that underlie these systems and to what degree you know, are one is one variable serving as a, a moderator or a mediator for, for another um, sort of influence, um, and I think that's uh, uh, you know it's something where people people have not yet done any significant work in that, and it needs to be done. Um, uh, I don't know if that's helpful. Those yeah. comments. The, those comments. Yeah. Um, other questions. So we. Uh, I'm, I'm tempted to suggest maybe going, uh, starting some things on, one thing with the Oculus, it's a serial system um, in the sense that right now um, only one person at a time can enter the ocular domain. Um, now Dorian uh, may eventually create a multi-user version of this system. Um, there's, there's work afoot. Uh, that that uh, he's he started in that direction. You know, uh, he has competing classes and and, uh, and other things that that will, that may uh, get in the way of that being realized very soon. But the idea of one one way we are going is to have multiple people ideally being able to view this system, and I can see where you are and you can see where I am, and we can say, hey, look, 
come on over here, you know, take, take a look at this. Um, and, and, you know, I can point to a data point. You'd see exactly what I'm seeing. You could say, well, take a look at this, this transformation. And you can see it. You guys are crazy. <laughs> we, we especially want to do that with certain Australian collaborators. Um, <laughs> So uh, right now it's a serial system. And so what I'd suggest, if people are okay with it, is that people who are interested can come up and don the mask. And you'll be able to see this virtual world. And you can experiment, and Jordan will have to show you. And I can answer questions in the meantime. And I can, I can uh, you know, help, help, uh, help you interpret what you've seen in the ocular sphere, okay? So, um, does anyone want to see the Oculus first? Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, so Tam, um, uh, you, you may engage. Um, okay, so uh, questions I can answer. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so how do you know that there's not like a boost of going on? Because we can, good, good question, very good question. And this is specifically a strength of, um, I should be recording this. Let me, let me just make sure. Yeah, I am. Um, this is specifically a strength of this technique. So, so the technique is, is able to distinguish between Y causes X and X causes Y. And the reason is, I'll try to express it for you, but uh, it's, 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 it, these things are subtle, so it, it, it may need further discussion, but I'll try to convey it and an answer to your question. When, if we look at whether Y influences X, what we're looking at there is we reconstruct the state space of X from X, the time series X, and we look at how the ability to predict the value of Y changes as we change the library size. From the, fr from this, reconstruction of the state space of X, of sub-pieces of the state space of X, we're seeing how well we can predict Y, okay? Because the idea is that, that if, if Y is driving X, that's part of its state space, and closeness in the state space in, in X will tell you, uh, will, will of necessity mean you're close in Y, because Y is part of that that space. It's like a dimension of that space. So if you're close in that space, you're close in value of Y. Now, it turns out that, so that's for X, whether X is being driven by Y. You flip that around, is Y being driven by X? Could, could for example, X not be driven by Y, but Y be driven by X? Can you distinguish that? You absolutely can. Because to see if X is driving Y, what you need to do is reconstruct it from Y's time series, reconstruct its shadow manifold for a different subset of Y, and ask how well it predicts X. And many experiments we've run, you have X impacting Y, for example, but not vice versa, and it's like night and day in terms of what it shows. It's very clear Y is influencing X and not vice versa. Similarly, if you have X influencing Y and Y X, in other words, you have reciprocal causality, you have both influencing each other, you can distinguish that from only one influencing the other from neither influencing the other. So, and the fundamental thing is that um, if, if Y is influencing X, then Y is part of the state space, but you, if you flip it around, you consider Okay, X is, down, if you consider X downstream of Y, Y is driving X, and X is downstream of it, and so it's being influenced by Y. What that tells you is information about Y is encoded in X. And in fact, it's encoded in the state space of X, so closeness in the state space reconstructed from X will predict Y. But the reverse is actually not true because X is not influencing Y. So when you consider what Y, if Y is driving X but not vice versa, when you consider Y state space, it's not gonna include X. It's not gonna have X as part of that state space because X is not driving it. it. It state space will have other things in it. And so closeness in Y's um, state space will mean nothing in terms of the values of X. 
And so you can distinguish those cases uh, in, a, in a very, very powerful way, okay? Um, so the Oculus is, is, is being used. You can actually see, for anyone who's, who's, who's able to see it through oblique angles or would like to come up here, we can actually see what they're seeing um, on the screen uh, and, and get a glimpse of that. It's just not in 3D. It's, it's uh, showing what's coming out of, of both, uh, both, uh, both. And, uh, okay, so yeah, cool. Okay, you should also show at some point the uh, Lorenz attractor. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Do you have an for that? I don't know if I have that. Uh, I think so. I think so. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, so uh, I hope that's helpful for understanding that. Are there any? Are there other questions I could answer? Other questions I could answer about this. Oh. Oh, okay. So, so wait. That's a uh, Oculus. Oh, cool. Okay. Okay. I, I, I do have that CSV doors, so I'll give it to you. Okay. Other questions I can answer. So, where will the Yeah. Um, do any of my students have a thumb drive? Sorry? If you have USB C, this one will be a lot faster, it's a dual end of. Oh, oh okay. Um, so you could use oh. either end. Oh. oh, oh, I see, I see. Okay, wow. Um, so I can just pull it out like this? And okay, yeah. Um, there we go. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm wondering if it's, is it possible it's right protected or something? I mean, I can, uh, I've encountered this before where sometimes, here, I can, I can do it as root. Yeah, that's fine. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I just remember because I wanted to, put Ubuntu on the lab machine before the whole reformatting thing was picked up mm -hmm. with the lost PhD work. Oh, yeah. Uh, I was, I burned an image on Ubuntu on there, so. I see. That's why. No, it, it's not. It won't let you. That's really weird. Very interesting. For this, this well, one from Christine. Okay, yeah. Why don't, why don't so I guess we'll just do that. Then. Let's, let's just try that. Yeah. yeah. I've seen this occasionally, though. I, uh, I'll pick everything up with that again because I don't need that image anymore. Okay, here, here we go. Sorry, thanks. Okay, there's. let's try Christine. Oh, absolutely. Let's give this... Uh, okay, this is, this is looking good. Um, okay, now... Okay, that, that works great. Dorian, 
do you want to um sorry okay oh okay i just transferred it onto a usb so um so we actually have that yeah so that's the lorenz and uh this is oh here's that's, I think that's the same one as I did before. Um, uh, okay, two Dorian CSV. Let's try that. Okay, data for oh here's oh. <laughs> with weather variables. The boot camp has been, <laughs> the boot camp has been oculist. Yes, it's been invaded by an alien presence. <laughs> That was psychic energy the occupants. I don't know if it been drained. Uh, drained. Drained and the, the oculus has increased its tyranny. Okay. The, the overlord, is it? Okay, here we go. Swear allegiance to our overlord. What of the of the Oculus? Yeah. Okay. Um, I can never work those bloody things. I need more gaming. More gaming. Okay, Dorian. <coughs> There's a a collection of CSVs which lie before you. Oh wow. Thank you. 
Questions I can answer for anyone. Maybe I'll stop recording this.